know where we are right so recording should start pretty soon but i'm just going to waffle away for a few seconds right then so folks episode three and i'm just going to say something here tis was which is a bit of an in joke by the writer because tis was was a 1970s children's television program at least i think it was i'm just gonna look it up uh this was no preparation at all i take all these here we go yes it says here tis was is a british television series that originally aired on saturday mornings from the 5th of january 1974 to the 3rd of april 1982 right so He's probably thinking you can get away with that joke for kids because those kids watching in 1990 won't know about um, uh, 1970s television and early 80s. So, yeah, so uh, little little things. I do like the effort that Ben Steed has put into to sort of creating a whole lingo uh, of the future. Um he even had a sort of a swear word in there when he said, shut up about your fluging appearance. And that was that light that there was a line in there that tickled me, Jeff, when I was a kid. Um, about uh, Sigma six being um, raised on muscle enhancing stereo foods. Mm -hmm. I thought that was quite clever stereo foods because it's, it's, it's quite close to steroids. So I thought that was good. Um, and then NT details like getting this techno babble to sound good. The idea that he said that that he could connect to his computer because when they first did time traveling, they sort of seeded. They had these sort of beacons through space and he could connect with the, with the beacon for that century that enabled him to communicate with his computer, with the, the vision. And then that enabled them to send the um i forgot i've forgotten what con it's called something con and they able to send it back in the washing machine and yeah it was received it was sent back uh and that tis was stands for trans isothermic wave shift modulator receiver so um right uh and then there was that there's that continuing the theme that started at the end of the last episode about the wristband not working properly and having to refuel it but he said oh it's fueled but it's still working a little bit uh incorrectly and so that sort of gets around the problem of um you know not using the wristband too much um and then i i, I thought with mufo at the end you know when she was talking to him and using all of that lingo all that lingo all that lingo i was thinking she just sounds like a regular ENFP. <laughs> um, it's the sort of sort of the same energy. Oh yes, and then little references that Jeff might not have got. Um, although you probably heard something similar on Sesame Street when she said, "Look through the square window." That's like references to play school. And then today we're going to learn days of the week. So uh, a reference to play school. Yeah. Um. So. That's all of my notes done. Now I'm going to read through this on screen for those that weren't having a read and see if there's anything that needs to be adjusted on this. Kappa 2. Oh, I, I, I forgot. I scrubbed out his full name. Kappa 2 adapts the phone line and Simon's computer so that he can talk to his computer in his time, which is the future. To find out what is wrong with his wristband, the computer advises Capitu that it just needs some more fuel to operate. The only problem is that the fuel is not available in Simon's time, nor will it be for the next 200 years. But by using Simon's washing machine and their next door neighbor's satellite dish, some more fuel can be transmitted back to um, uh, Simon. Kappa 2 does this and now has regained the use of his wristband, but also confesses to Steve, Simon's best friend, after a little time. And seeing Kappa 2 beam out of Simon's kitchen, Steve comes to realise the truth. Now, that sentence is not brilliant. It's like you've got two sort of sentences mangled together. 
Uh, and if I hadn't have read it before, it would have been difficult to read out. Kappa 2, on the other hand, uh, does not do well in the local football match against another school, which Simon watches from the future very unhappily. Simon does really well in the hypergrid contest, though, and beats Sigma 6, to everybody's surprise and delight. Sigma 6, on the other hand, does not accept defeat graciously and beams into Kappa 2's dome and accuses what he believes is Kappa 2 of cheating. So, Jeff, what did you think of the episode? I liked it. Um, it's it was fun. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of the things I thought of when you were talking. Um, yeah, you talked. You mentioned the the the, the made up swear word thing. It immediately reminded me of uh, the the cartoon, The Pirates of Dark Water, because they did that. They very cleverly got around the fact this a kids show, but we've got pirates who are not exactly. Uh, known for speaking in in uh in in etiquette uh you know in nice language so they made up words for them to say like noisy <laughs> and and they would use they would kind of use variations of that like the it'd be like that jetotten bird you know that said that you know they did stuff like that and it was it was it was funny and well done so anyway that's what it reminded me of and yeah i love the string of uh of stuff that uh move for rattles off on the <laughs> thing i couldn't even possibly remember all that but it was great uh um and yeah she's uh i mean of course uh the uh, the blonde girl only got about 30 seconds of airtime in this episode but 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 uh move for is definitely uh more attractive in my opinion so do you think she has a little bit of that quality that's like where she, where her character comes across is ENFP. Even though she's not ENFP, she sort of says the kind of weird stuff that an ENFP would say. It is just this kind of like. Oh, you know, it's hard to tell on that. Yes. Yeah. Even among ENFPs, there, there's, uh, you know, there are varying levels of all that kind of thing. So yeah, uh, yeah. And a lot of a lot of other factors, but yeah, I like all the presentation of the you know the contest and stuff. Uh, the way they did it with the. Um, the TV broadcast and the, the even the commercial for whatever it was supposed to to be it's like it, it's you know I, on Doctor Who they got accused of like sometimes putting you know filling things with techno babble and stuff but this type of show it works really well because the whole point is like you're not supposed to understand it but it comes off as seem is sounding like it makes sense if you know yeah. what I mean. Like it doesn't just sound like a, a it's complete gobbledygook. It sounds like because it's presented well, it's it seems natural. Yeah, so. and, and from an NT point of view, it is internally consistent with the ideas, so it's good techno babble. Well, that's why I wondered about a couple of the things they said, like the thing about kilojoules. I mean, I know that's a measurement of energy, but I, I was I wasn't sure exactly how they were relating that to, you know, it, it was it supposed to be like energy potential of each person or something? I don't know. There, were, well, there were, maybe, maybe their maximum strength is sort of like how many kilojoules they can, uh, I mean, let's, I mean, yeah, I from my perspective, obviously I don't know enough <laughs> science to know whether or not it, it was gobbledygook or whether it made any sense or not. So for me, I, that was just one of the things I thought of that, um, you know, people, might say and once again i'll mention star trek but that's because i i watch i'm watching the ones that aired in 92 and i watch them saturday night so i'm always that's like this the other sci-fi thing that i'm watching so that, last night they had the episode um where jordy and uh ensign Rowe, played by michelle forbes who was also on homicide among other things oh yes uh are sort of in this other phase because there's like a transporter accident and they wind up sort of outside of uh, of space or whatever you want to call it, where they're in on the Enterprise, but they're not on the Enterprise. And But the thing is, they talk about how they can pass through matter, but they're just standing on the floor. So rather, so my first thought is, you know, the real science nerds on this are going to be like, why aren't they uh, just falling into space? Because why would gravity still apply to them and why would they be standing on the floor if they can pass through all the other matter around them so anyway 
uh, just, just an example of those little things will sometimes occur to me. Uh, obviously, in, as far as the story goes, I didn't care, but I just I, I was I could observe that and think this is the kind of thing the real nitpicky people are going to mention. Um, so th I thought the same thing about this is that I there were certain there's certain aspects of the science that they'll say where I don't know enough to know whether or not it makes any sense. But as far as an entertaining story, it still was to me. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so Wojtek, if he enters folks, he's studied physics, at a sort of a master's degree level. And so he could let us know basically what 50 kilojoules equates to in terms of like, it, like if you tried to convert it into say a power reading i got something like 13 kilowatt hours or something but it's a, it's a reasonable measure of uh of energy but without sort of getting in antenna so there's another thing about i like the bit towards the end like and you're know, avoiding the swear words and it says i don't give a computer <laughs> yeah that was a little bit awkward just because of like i didn't if there if he'd had a reason to interrupt him like to ask him something. That's what I was expecting to. I didn't expect. It doesn't seem real consistent with the character for him to interrupt just to like stop him from saying something because he doesn't really have. It just doesn't seem like he would have a reason to do that. So that's a good yeah. point. That's a good point. Yeah, established him of, uh, as any having any particular aversion to any any language or anything. So that seemed a little bit awkward. Oh, it's within think he immediately followed that with like computer we need to focus on whatever the other thing and like there's something he did he interrupted him because he was trying to get ah, just, good point uh, just being uh stopping him from saying something that's a good point uh and that's where you get to if you when you follow the motivation and really going from the inside out you actually get to better results yeah so that th kind of thing strikes me as the writer trying to be a little too clever uh you know and not giving a you know a, a reasonable a logical reason for that to occur like you, you just got to think a little bit more of okay why <laughs> what needs to be the next thing as opposed to it just being a gimmick right um so yeah high quality techno bubble um i like that they had the friend like smart enough that when he was talking about the rotating uh, thing he needed that he said that he was able to think of the washing machine. Yeah. So they, they don't make him like completely clueless. You know, he's able to sort of put things together and figure out that, you know, yeah. what the guy's talking about. But uh, And also that they didn't have him. They, I think he was realistic, his reactions in terms of first not believing him about not being Simon, but then sort of, kind of putting together the clues he's already had of him acting weird to just be like, you know, maybe there is something to what he's saying. And then when he sees the thing on the screen, he's like, okay, well, there's, there's no better explanation for this. So for the time being, anyway, I'm going to believe what he says. Yep. Nothing else makes sense. I think he said, uh, so I thought I liked that as opposed to him having some sort of a uh, huge over the top reaction to it or something. Yeah. Uh, what else about this episode? Um, you sort of there's there's enough of a uh, I like that they put a little bit of effort into working out sort of like the rules of the uh, hypergrid, and that might have been got into a bit more in the in the book because apparently it was based on a, on a children's book. Uh, and I'm not so sure about the second series might have been based on another book. Um, yeah, the, the actual hypergrid competition, like I said, the presentation of it was good, but yeah, I did kind of sit there going, I can't really understand what it is they're supposed to do. Cause if it's just to shoot the other guy with the thing, then it seems like that's really easy to do. So I didn't quite get what the, uh, what was supposed to be the challenge of it. <laughs> So the rules or, or or what was supposed to be done there was a little bit awkward in terms of, and I realized they yeah. don't have obligation to explain it to me, but it just seemed like it it, made, it se made it seem like they didn't quite know what to do, so they just sort of were like, let's gonna 
we're going to cut back and forth so it looks like something's happening without really establishing what what is going on so yeah, I mean, if they, I mean, if they'd have come up with like a, a a proper game, they could have actually made it into a real thing. Uh, but now, there, that's something. Ah, there's a memory for me. There's a memory for me right there at school. Did you have head bags in the United States, Jeff? Uh, I don't know, maybe. Because like like both of them are head bags. When I went to school, I had head bags like every year, sort of like maybe a different head bag. I didn't have that one, but the other one, the grey one that, with the... Is that a brand I, name? That's the brand name, Head. Yeah, yeah there were so many. Like, that was the, the brand of bags, all the nearly all... the 50%, mainly boys for the head bags. Uh, there, there, there were some... Uh, I think there was a... a yeah. I, would, I never really paid much attention to brands. I mean, I, kn I knew some just because of like commercials or other things, but, um, you know, maybe t there's only two times I can think of in my life where I like paid any attention. One was shoes because, um, and I didn't really care as much about the brand shoes. It was just sort of a thing where, you know, certain brands of shoes were popular. And when, yeah. and of course my parents would always get the cheaper versions of everything. So, you know, we could be as uncool as possible. Uh, so <laughs> I the, I remember, for whatever reason, you know, the usual shoes that we got that were cheap and fell apart and were and kids would make fun of. There was one time where uh, my dad spent a little extra money to get, I think it was Stadia, if I remember right, which was like the knockoff brand of Reebok. So the, the salesperson in the store was actually telling them like they're, they're exactly the same as the Reebok shoes with a different brand. So they're, you know, 20 bucks cheaper or whatever it was. And so he actually got that as opposed to the two kids. Basically, I guess the salesman was able to convince him they were more durable so he wouldn't have to buy shoes. Right. But so. I, it wasn't because, really because of the brand. It was because of the, the quality of the product and the features yeah. that were in yeah, the, the head bags. And I remember the um, that for a while there were these shorts that were popular that the brand That's name was Jams, and I remember that my parents were only willing to get them after they were like in the discount bin, and that's when they weren't popular anymore. So they were popular for just like a few months. They were like the thing in junior high or whatever, you know. And then I was like telling my mom, "Oh, we have to! I have to get these Jam shorts." And then when I finally got them. Uh, they weren't cool anymore, and I didn't even like it really because they weren't <laughs> cool, and they only had one pocket in the back. So if I put my wallet in my back pocket, then I would sit on my wallet and it was uncomfortable. So Yeah, and as you said, when the Guardians wear it, it's out of fashion. <laughs> or, is that, or, 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 or rather, it's in fashion, but you want to be ahead of that trend. Yeah, something. Anyway, I was never ahead of anything uh, because, you know, my parents bought whatever the cheap stuff was so only if there was a time where you know uh secondhand garage sale uh clothes were were the top fashion which i can't remember that ever being the case when i was a kid but there may have been certain periods where that was considered cool for somebody and then if that would have been the one time that i would have been on the cutting edge but anyway um so i don't specifically remember the head brand but i may have seen it i don't remember Right there. Um, I'm gonna see, send a little message. I did, I did take note of Steve's jacket because I remember you making a big deal about the dude on Homicide who had a jacket like that, sort of a windbreaker jacket. Um, and you made it sound like that was like a really '90s thing, like it was out of fashion now or something. But I didn't honestly notice. Like I don't know whether that anybody wears that type of jacket anymore or not because I I. I just didn't really pay that much attention. So just to me, it looked like a normal jacket, but I did notice. Oh, well, whilst we're on the subject then of uh, 1990s sort of stuff, we could I could sort of give you an idea what I mean. Um, uh, I just, uh, that's not right. Right, it's going to... Um, 
put that over there whilst we wait see if Voitech arrives uh, I'll just so I think it was shell suit that I mentioned this sort of thing yeah so like a windbreaker <laughs> But the, some of those are just like, you know, matching pants, but that's really the only difference. Yeah. Right. And they were... What I remember about those is when, when I would get them, like, I would usually not wear the pants. I would just wear the jacket part. So <laughs> the pants would, like, quickly get lost somewhere <laughs> because I wouldn't wear them. And then it would be like, oh, I don't know where the pants went because I don't know, I don't know if they weren't comfortable. I just didn't think they looked good yeah very baggy fashion I, mean, I never wore one that was that uh like shiny that way though <laughs> you know what i mean like these these particular ones you're looking at are like yeah i mean i had one that was fairly close to that i did have like the purple green combination at one point i think but uh anyway most of them were less sort of outrageous looking <laughs> and these hairstyles, man. I don't know what's up with that. Uh, never had that. But. Yeah. Um, so if we're going to go... It's okay. If we were going down... Anyway, there. Steve's jacket was not like that, but it, it was a windbreaker. No. Kind of a, like a poofy windbreaker. Yeah, they had... Um, well, I remember what... They would have, like... Kids at school would have, like, ski jackets... That was something that was in fashion. Uh, some kind of like, but it would have to be. Uh, I have to put put early nineties. This is maybe sort of something like this. That kind of thing that. Anyhow, all I'm thinking about is, uh, so let's get this, uh, whilst we're on this topic of, there we go, this kind of thing. These kind of bags, like high quality bags. Um, they got a lot of like, this is not just the brand name, you got, now the problem is, these tags, kids would like twist them off and that and they would say that they'd been tagged so what i would do is i would tuck it inside so it wasn't available to be twisted off yeah i think the only thing like that i can think of like in school was the tennis players had their tennis bags and usually those were like nike or adidas things yeah. so uh but i don't really recall anybody else um because as far as just like regular people around school, it was like just backpacks rather than that type. Of yeah, I mean, I mean, I did transition to backpack. Oh, there you go. There's the uh, girls' version, I presume, of the uh, yeah. And I was paying attention to what the girls were, were <laughs> carrying around. So. Yeah. Um, if I was paying yeah. attention to the girls, it wasn't their bags I was looking. Yeah. At. And then I would, uh, and, then, and then I would, I alternated between like lots of different kinds of bags. And then sometimes I would go minimalist and just have the tiny, um, the head bag, like. But but those two like uh, characters, like they had the big head bags, and I had one like that in my first year when I was. Ooh like, la la. <laughs> well, who was ooh la la? The like, carrying it's, it's, that all these different bags, like. I think I would have a backpack like where I use that backpack until it fell apart, and then my dad would be willing to buy another backpack. Right, and it was like, uh... if I had said, "Oh, I need a new bag," he would have been like, "Why? Your old one's fine." <laughs> right. um, how good are in between between carrying like loads of stuff, like carrying a huge bag when you're like, eleven years old, on like a half an hour walk to school uh right yeah most of my my uh years going to school i was riding my bike um so 
yeah, it could be heavy if I had multiple books in the backpack on the way, but uh, still yeah, but, was durable just, enough it would have uh, multiple years worth of use out of the backpack. Yeah, I think like most of the time, I mean, I did have a lot of backpack action going on because that it was more comfortable. And of course, later on, with a lot more padded arms, it had some much better backpack. I could actually show you a super deluxe backpack. Swiss gear. We're digressing now, folks, but this is a good one. This is a highly good one. And this is a this is um over engineered. This is ridiculously over engineered. Uh, but this is a high quality bag. One doesn't need a um a handle where it's metal <laughs> metal wire going through it. And it's got like 17 pockets in it and like padded straps and like a laptop compartment quite and it's got the whole so yeah i mean the bags got really uh these really elaborate swiss gear swiss gear bag and yeah very uh lots of padding on that and it doesn't show up very well on the uh Let's see if we can. Ah, ha ha. You see that? Look at all that pattern. And uh, I think I might have a laptop in here. Yeah, I've got an old laptop in there. <laughs> 17 inch. And it goes in that um, that big like pocket. Like I said, because this was the only bag they did that could take a 17 inch laptop. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, th those uh, periods didn't do not overlap for me. I didn't get my first laptop until many years after I stopped using a backpack. So. Yeah, but like this is like typical over engineering stuff for guys. Like, let's put a steel wire in a handle. Like, you don't need all of that strength, but it just looks tough. <laughs> so, right. If you say so. <laughs> well, uh, uh, poor choice of words. It looks over engineered. But it looks cool. Um, I'll, I'll put that back later on. All right. Um, all right, then. So, faffing around, all, all the 90s things that happened. Oh, there's an interesting one. Yes. Yeah. Um, is that? I should show that on screen. So, I might have one time had a bag, not this color scheme. I hasten to add, but like where you had a detachable end pocket, and then sometimes you just go just with that. It was a bit, but yeah, anyway, so early 90s stuff, right? Um, what else? Um, so any, um, I don't know what to do. Um, we'll go um, back, yeah. To the screenshots of the show and maybe okay, I'll yeah, see something, but uh, yeah, okay, there we go, and I'll uh, see if anything uh, pops up that you would like to comment on. I I liked that they uh, followed up with the um, the followed up's not the right word, but like they're consistent with the uh. Capitu doesn't have the energy like physically so that when he goes out to play soccer, then he like doesn't have the stamina. Not only does he not know what he's doing, but he falls over <laughs> and collapses because he has, doesn't have the energy to do anything. Uh, so, well, what he did was a hard day's work for an NT, like going off a ladder, doing all the things, taking it back off a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Pooped off the well, I mean, from what he said in his time, whatever, it's not just in tees or whatever it's everybody like because they're just they're not in the same physical shape oh yeah 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 but yeah it wins the uh the competition then you know they think he must have cheated and even yeah, but, though it looked like it really required that much physical stamina anyway so uh but i don't know because i didn't quite get what was required but uh, yeah 
yeah, I mean, that the actual physical aspect wasn't that much. But the good thing about it, like I said, is it's sort of like the presentation of it because it's fast paced and it just sort of goes back and forth and shows these things happening. It, especially at the time, you know, yes, VCRs were around, so somebody probably recorded this and may have, uh, and may have played it back and analyzed it. But for the most part, most of the audience is just watching it once and it goes by fast. And so it's just sort of like, you know, was this a fun, cool show? Yeah, because because a child at the time would like have to have had like access to the video recorder, have their own tape, go back and uh, watch it. Yeah, I mean, even I, like, I was recording tons of things at that time but most of them I didn't watch over and over again. There were a few exceptions to that. Uh, <laughs> and usually that was revolving around girls. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, as I hit my teenage years, there would be, you know, it wasn't like today, uh, kids in the audience, uh, where you can just type a few words into the, your search engine and look up whatever actress you want to. In those days, like, if your favorite uh, character uh, on the soap opera was on for, like, one scene that lasted two minutes, then yeah, I might have uh, I might have rewound and played that scene over and over again <laughs> because it was the only glimpse I was going to get of uh, Donna Logan on the Bold and the Beautiful <laughs> for months because they really didn't. In at that particular time, I'm thinking of when I recorded a scene of hers, she wasn't featured nearly enough, so it was like this precious few minutes that she was on screen. Yeah, you have to take what you could get. <laughs> exactly. So, so at the time, I might have rewound to, to, to rewatch the scene of uh, Moo Four on the video screen, rattling off uh, her slang. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it is remarkable there. Oh, that's the wrong one. It's upside down. Let's see, pick this one. I mean, the set. That is someone with a receding hairline at eighteen. So You're always picking on his hairline. Yeah, I know. I don't know what it is with me. I mean, I'm fooled myself. It's just I just thought it was remarkable at such a young age. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah. Um. It 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 had a good pace. Yeah. To it, the. Uh, and I like that they leave things. I like the continuing. Uh, flow of the story through episodes that they're not worried yeah. about sort of continuing things and like leaving things hanging. Like they have the sort of ominous line where uh, Steve says something about Lucy said she was going to Sharon's, but he didn't actually see that she got over there. So it sort of implies maybe something happened to her that we'll find out about later or something, you know? So there's little things like that, that, um, you know, whether or not it's paid off, hopefully it is, but even if it wasn't, it still just adds to sort of the realism of it that there's these little moments where not everything is wrapped up perfectly at the end of the episode. There's you, the continuing threads. You sort of notice these things in writers, like because we've watched a lot of like Doctor Who, where writers, like especially with Robert Holmes, his early stuff versus his late, his middle stuff and later stuff, and you could see him improve as a writer. Um, with this, where you've got Ben Steed, and he wrote those three Blake Seven stories. And you didn't like either of them, any of them. Um, I like that guy. I like, I like that bold guy who was like presenting it. He did well with that small part. Um, uh, and the little bit I liked where he didn't need to add it, but that stuff about having like these nodes that are sort of like in each time period. And he could connect to the node and that is what enables him to uh connect to his computer for the vision and it's like that is just something that is like it wasn't actually necessary to have people could people could have just sort of gone away okay he's finagled it so he's able to see his but like he added that detail of of that idea of coming up with a sort of a backstory that these time travelers have sort of like left a nexus for each century that can be communicated with across time. And I thought that was an interesting uh, detail in that I can appreciate that the writer has um, put thought into it 
in sort of uh uh building the world uh right yeah uh so i give it about uh eight out of ten i also give it eight out of ten right so we're back to the standard of the first episode in terms of our scores i i think we've um our ratings have been well maybe not the same every way i think that maybe it was one week we were different but i think we've been the same the other the other yeah. so i Which think there's is, only one time we we disagreed and we were only off by one i think that time so. yeah it's very unusual for us to have like like the only other time was like doctor who with uh genesis of the daleks uh yeah we both liked it but like yeah our scores would be up and down for uh although well, we're yeah, pretty con yeah. we're pretty consistent with man and machine yeah so usually just, uh, just not like as often so like there's, there's yeah. times to which you know and i think you know when we see shows that are among the best of something like we both obviously rated um three men and adina from homicide really yeah. high so we both gave that a 10 you know, examples like that but but then other ones we were like very uh, far apart so it depends and it's interesting because i mean when, when we get to season two of uh kappa two because that's made in 1992 you've got a nice little overlap there with man and machine that was made at the similar time and mm -hmm. in comparing the two series it's like for me the interest in man and machine is eve it's not really the plot it's her as a character and so it's like the character details of that is of what interests me and i find like the plots not that is interesting like like detectives whereas this my interest in this is completely different part of its nostalgia and the other part of it is the ideas that's going on so maybe if if it was like eve with, with these kind of ideas that would be like uh the perfect combination uh for me whereas and that was always that was a, that was a chick that was a, the the old thing i had with homicide life in the street where it was like i would watch an episode it would be like oh that was a good episode if you like that sort of thing in terms of the genre because if you're not that much of a fan of the genre it's mainly the characters that i was interested in in uh homicide yeah usually for me it's sort of the opposite in the sense that um i i'm open to being entertained by anything but there are certain genres i guess or certain themes that i just don't like and so in order for me to enjoy something of that type of thing it has to be radically different than that type of thing normally is right. and there are some examples of that such as i don't like musicals like stage musicals but les miserables is one of my favorite things i've ever seen but it's because it's so much better than all of the stupid campy musicals that are so popular like chicago which inexplicably well not inexplicably but it won the oscar for the movie version and it's terrible <laughs> it's torturous but a lot of people love that kind of thing. They love stupid, over-the-top, campy, <laughs> dumb things with you know, with good actors in them that do doing stupid songs. Um, <laughs> but because Les Miserables is so much better in every way than those things, it rises above that. So there's examples of that in other forms. But like I was thinking about the other day because I was thinking of something. Uh, I was trying to think because I was talking to somebody about how much I hate werewolves. Uh, <laughs> the werewolf thing I've ever seen has been terrible. Uh, it just as a rule. So I just said like werewolf things are just not good. I was trying to think of any example of something that I saw that I was entertained by that in any way involved werewolves. And I was like, well, on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, they had the one character that Seth Green played that turned into a werewolf. The, it, because it wasn't really the focus of the show, it was just sort of a side thing with a supporting character. That wasn't too bad. <laughs> but if they focused any more on it, I probably would have hated it. But the fact that it was just wasn't really the main focus, it just was this thing that added texture. 
right so jeff the only the, the, i think the maybe the previous episode the only downside to the poem is like the way you felt about this character how did you feel about this character in this episode um, it was still probably the weakest link but uh not as bad because like i said it didn't come across quite as over the top and i actually did sort of like the random insertion of the don't worry be happy song but <laughs> that may just be because that's that is so much my era late 80s early 90s and that, that's not one of my favorite songs or anything but it was appropriate in the use it fit the situation and i can imagine that the computer is trying to is trying to make pop culture references that simon will get so that's why it fits oh i've got the perfect actor for that part and let him do his own lines robin williams would have been brilliant oh, in yeah that part. <laughs> it's exactly the type of i mean he pretty much was that role when he was the genie in aladdin i mean that's the same yeah. type of where it's like the 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 um not mentor exactly but like the helper the helper robot <laughs> in, in in the situation so yeah um yeah. And, and of course, Robin Williams would have been better, but uh, nothing against this guy. But <laughs> but anyway, I, I think I thought the concept of having the human was kind of dumb. Like, honestly, that's one area where I thought Blake Seven did a better job by having the voice of the computer on the ship. Uh, but you don't you didn't see like a human manifestation. It was just the wavy lines that they would have on the screen representing yeah. the voice. So. And they did that on Doctor Who too with the uh, the Green Death. They had the boss computer that you saw the like the sound wave looking graphic on the screen. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, or if you're gonna have a computer, I have a really good looking computer. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure what that uh, that would be for, unless. Uh, Unless the, the well, okay, 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 Jeff. If you're on a ship and you had a computer, would you want it to be a really, really good looking computer? Well, what do you mean by good looking computer? Well, well okay, that had the ability to appear in physical form. Say that, say that woman, what was it? What was she in the 80s? Was she called Donna Logan? Oh, yeah, <laughs> how would you, would you like to have a computer appear in the form of Donna Logan? Well, yeah, that'd be better, obviously. But <laughs> and the funny thing about that is, just for anybody who happens to the, the the odds of someone watching this that's that also watches the Bold and Beautiful, I know, are pretty low. But the character Donna Logan uh, came back and may even still be on the show, but played by a different actress for many years. So not the person. The 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 actress I'm talking about was Carrie Mitchum, who's the granddaughter of Robert Mitchum. For anybody who knows that actor, he's pretty famous. But um, uh, and she got a dimple in her chin as well. I don't remember, <laughs> but anyway, um, she was the she was the best of the Logan sisters. But they two out of the three of them, the actresses that play them now or more recently are not the same as the originals. One of them is Catherine Kelly Lang, who's been on the show since it started, uh, and looked almost exactly the same for about thirty years before she finally started to age. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I, I, I actually think the actor Simon Nash was a little bit better in this one. Like he didn't like there weren't any bits of acting that really sort of like took me out of it. It was sort of like more. Sometimes that can happen with someone who's marginal. And I thought it was okay. It was all passable in this. It, there wasn't anything throwing throwing me off. Hey, I am. Um... I mean, I, I the characters seem like the characters. Yeah, That's all I really ask for when it comes to acting, as long as it's not so bad that it takes me out of the scene in some way, and it's not. So they yeah. all seem like to be be doing a good enough job. Like I said, with uh, the actress playing Lucy, um, I the I, the impression I got was she's inexperienced, but she has a flair to her where you can tell like she's somebody who has the potential to be yeah to throw into the into the acting you know it's just she's just not there yet but it's not like she's bad it's just her um her sort of mannerisms or her her, her presentation is is past her uh her dialogue reading isn't isn't quite caught up with that if you know what i mean <laughs> 
So it almost probably would have been better if they had just told her ad lib what you think this character would say than read the, reading the dialogue, because the only time she sounds awkward is when she's trying to spit out too much of the dialogue from the script too yeah. fast. But yeah. it's, again, it's not so off-putting that it takes me out of the scene or anything. It's just I noticed that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think she had a what? What's her name? Let's have a look. Let's uh, let's have a little look at. So Lucy, let's look at the actress who plays Lucy, and then look at her record. Uh, right, Carol Cashmere, Derek Cashmere, Lucy Cat, Nina. Oh, that's a nice name to spell. Right. <sighs> What? Right. Nina. Well, she's got an IMDb entry. Let's, uh, let me. Oh, what are you doing looking up what else she did? I actually did that last week, I think. Either that or the week before. Because I was trying to see if, because uh, um, sometimes you have child actors, they don't actually go on to act as adults. And in her case, she did. Uh, yeah. Now, the one that, uh, what I'm going to show you is I want to see if you get anything out of um, let me just get this uh, what's she called right that one what is she 1976 1976 that'd be about the right age yeah that'd be the right one like, she didn't quite a lot here well ish well, she's sort of come back recently, I suppose. I've noticed that about quite a few people that I've looked up on IMDb. There's been several people that I don't know if there's something about maybe it's the the era, the Netflix era or whatever you want to call it, where there's been a lot more um, sort of independently produced things rather than, you know, t TV being all on certain networks or things like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's more, maybe maybe more opportunities for actors that have not not been blacklisted, but I mean, they just sort of haven't been the 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 go-to ones that get called. You know, if you know what I mean. Like, so it yeah. seems like several people have come back in in more recent years because maybe there's just been more opportunity for actors in general. Now, maybe right. not in the past year, <laughs> but before that, you know, prior to 2020. Yeah, I'm just going to find a particular actress that's in uh, uh, in season two. And just to give an example of all the stuff that she's been in. Uh, right. Uh, there she is. Right. Right, I can go back to show her now. So here she is, Sarah Alexander. So she's been on a lot of stuff. You can see, can you see that on screen? Yes. Right, so she's been on a lot of stuff, and you might like the look of her in um, 1990. Simon did. <laughs> All right, anyway, you don't want plot details about season two. Uh, but um, anyway, so uh, let's have a look. Right. Uh, that's not right. Images. What do you think, Jeff? I think uh, uh, you've gone off track again. Yeah, okay. Uh, you will reserve your judgment when you get to season two and uh, meet Sarah Alexander. Right. Right then. Let's get back on track. So, yes, eight out of ten. Uh, eight out of ten from you. And uh, going down memory lane. So, uh, anything else you'd like to say, Jeff, about the episode? No, not really. 
Join us right. for this week's other title with time in it somewhere. Yes. Yes. <laughs> bye bye, folks. Bye. <laughs>